show the people that each had an equal opportunity of being one with God. He worked hard to show the need to eliminate the current ritualistic pra practices that were incorporated into people's lives. Acts such as throwing water into the sun with the fallible belief that it will quench the thirst of their long lost ancestors. Or giving alms to Brahmana in whatever form they asked, whether that be money, property, or unmarried virgins, in the belief that this will appease their gods. These futile and worthless rituals are what compel Guruji to go on tremendous journeys and give up his settled life and family. These are the idiocracies that put him on the path to educating the masses. This was no easy task, especially when he was questioning their way of life. But Guru Nanak Dev Ji went about preaching and teaching with pure love and compassion. Many tend to say that he merely used radical logic to educate. I don't entirely agree with this view because it undermines the amount of compassion and love that he showed while he conveyed his message. Do you think he was merely using logic when forgiving Sajjan Thug after he had been given poison to drink? If there was no compassion for Sajjan and his ability to improve, Guruji might have just reported it to the local authorities. But no, Guruji went to his house and showed him the right path through his own eyes. Do you disagree that he was being accepting and understanding instead of radical when steering the sins living on the mountains off their dangerous path and accepting them as his followers? Don't you believe that he had immense compassion and love for the world as he gave up his life, family, and loved ones to educate as many of the populace as he could? As an educator, Guruji taught three main things. First, that we should make a decent living via our own hard-earned work and not lazily fulfill our needs off of others. Then truly we shall value our actions and be just and fair. Second is to put our life onto the path of spiritual enlightenment. This does not mean simply to meditate, but it means to bring Guru's virtues into our lives. Thirdly and lastly, we must be in touch with our surroundings and be working proactively to assist our society. The simplest way that he required us to do so is to merely serve and share our wealth with the people around us. Whatever wealth it might be, money, food, or even knowledge, and whatever form that may be, giving back, charity, or just simply compassion. Now let's ask ourselves, are we living up to the standards set by Abuji? Am I? Are we at all? We have yet a long way to go. Because the path is not easy, we habitually fall to our lazy, selfish, and attached nature. <coughs> Most of us have good intentions and urge to do right, but either we are pulled away by the larger crowd mocking us, or we get caught up in our own little worlds. In my opinion, in order to cope with this problem, we need to recognize that the hard part is not to adopt good intention, <coughs> or even put ourselves on the path to enlightenment, but it is to stay on and not get continually lost in the myriad of side roads or be clawed back by creatures surrounding us. <coughs> Guruji, through his love and compassion, showed the world how to live their life in such manners that would bring them happiness. We too should follow his advice and stay on the path. Stay with the journey and stay with what Guruji has taught us. Why Guruji ka khalsa, why Guruji ki fate? Guruji ka khalsa, why Guruji ki fate? The book I will be discussing with you today is called The Life Sketch and Teaches of Guru Nanak Dev Ji. The first question asks to explain the situations of religious and political affairs when Guruji arrived. When Guru Nanak arrived in this world, there were many religions with numerous praise leaders. Brahmins, Ghazis, Yogis all thought of themselves as supreme beings. The Hindu religion was completely divided by the awful caste system. Brahmins manipulated the meaning of their holy scriptures and made fools of the lower classes. They told people to perform ritualistic worship, such as the yagya, in which people were told to sacrifice themselves, and they give all their belongings to the Brahmins. The people were following the Brahmins' guidelines blindly. They never questioned why they were performing such rituals. Guruji saved them from falling on these events. Hindu mulle, bale kurti jani. 
नारद के हाथ से पूछ कर आई अंधे होंगे अंधा पाथर्य पूछे मुगर दुआ वही जा आप डूबे तुम कहा तरना Yogis were another sect of Hinduism who believed in the teachings of Gaudiya. According to their beliefs, the yogis thought that if one wants to achieve a realization of God, then one must control the mind, for that is the key. They believed that this was not possible as long as they were still living among worldly influences. So they went to jungles, performing exercises to keep their minds attached. However, when they needed daily necessities such as food, clothing, and water, they would go back to the public, whom they had detached themselves from, for their spiritual purposes. They would do unreasonable things, for instance. Applying ash to one's body, wearing big earrings, carrying a staff, and holding a comb was all part of their faith. Guruji explained that these practices cannot lead to the realization of God. He says, "Jog na kinta, jog na dande, jog na pasam chadaye, jog na mundi mur mudaye, jog na sinji vaye, anjan vahe niranjan dhiye, jog vich jiga ev paaye, gali jog na hoye, ek dress kar samsar, jaane jog kahiye sor." Another group of Hinduism is known as the Jain Hermits, who believe in non-violence. In fact, they were so strict on the concept of it that they avoided taking a bath so as no harm would come to the creatures in the water. Not only this, they kept their mouths covered, carried a broom made of cotton to clean the place with before sitting on, and walked in line one behind the other, so as the lady hermit would make sure there were no insects on the path. The phobia of violence against any kind of creature had made their lives unhygienic and filthy. When Guruji looked upon their practices, he felt sad. Not for them, but for their children, who were left behind by them, hungry and poor. Gossips were the leaders of the Muslim society. Their job was to spread the gospel of the Islamic religion, but they wasted time by pleasing the ruling officials. To discourage the Hindu social order, they would annex any eating of their choice from the gossips. Guruji says, "Kaji koi ke bahenia, fere dasti kare khuda, vadi lake haq gawai, jeko pache ta parsona." So much prominence for quality has been laid in the Quran. Yet improper preaching by the Qazis has led the Islamic religion to be divided into many sects. For example, look at the Shia and the Sunni. They've been fighting for decades. In fact, they're sworn enemies even today. So, Sadhguruji, if we cannot fix the impurities within our own way of lifestyle, how can we go out there and preach our beliefs? In conclusion, when Guru Nanak Dev Ji arrived in this world, Islam and Hinduism dominated India. Each religion was divided into different sects with different beliefs. Neither of the two had a very strong base in the main equality. People were wasting their lives, living in isolation, and leaving behind loved ones. Fortunately, we now pulled them from the darkness, opened their eyes, and put them on the path of righteousness. The political conditions during Guruji's time were shaken up too. The Muslims from Arab would come and invade India over and over again. The first invasion was under the leadership of Muhammad bin Qasim in 712 AD. This invasion started the misery of the Indian people. Invaders took wealth and women many times. Not only this, men and women were taken as slaves back to Arab. And to cover all this up, the Muslims used the excuse of jihad, a war for the sake of their religion. But hardly was this a war, or for the sake of their religion. During the Nine Ages time, Bin Rokhodi was the first Afghan ruling in Delhi and the last dynasty. After his death, his son Sikandar Modi took the throne and made Agra the capital instead of Delhi. During his rule period, he targeted the Hindu society. Furthermore, he was the one who physically tortured Pandit Kabiri by putting him in front of a mad, intoxicated elephant. He made he demolished Hindu temples to the ground, made the Hindus pay jazya, a tax that Hindus had to pay to the Muslims just to keep their lives. Guru Nanak Ji says, "Kalkati Rajya ka sai, param pang kar padaya, kur amavas sach chandrama dije nahi kya chaliya." Guru Ji took long and tedious odysseys because he needed to spread the message of God. His job was to spread the ideology of Sikhism. He diminished the worshiping of idols and rituals to put no meaning, and told people that by living in isolation, one cannot achieve the way to God. People didn't question the practices they were performing. They were ignorant because the Brahmins had controlled their lives for such a long time. They manipulated the thinking of others for their own gains. Guruji went all over India just to make sure that people knew that Brahmins were taking advantage of them and were using them by the means of trickery. Also, Guruji had the courage to express his beliefs. He challenged the Brahmins' beliefs. In Hardwar, a big fair used to be held on the day of the Vesak. People used to come and throw water to the sun, thinking that it would reach their ancestors in the land of the dead, known as Pitharlok. To show the worthlessness of this ritual, Guru Nanak thought of a unique way to show the people where their mistake was. So he started throwing water in the opposite direction. The head pundit asked Guruji, "Why are you throwing water in the opposite direction?" Guruji replied, "He was watering his fields in the Bundi, which are 400 to 300 miles away." The ignorant pundit said, "His water cannot reach that far." Guruji replied. If your water can reach the sun, which is millions of miles away, why can't my water reach the fields of the Bundi, which are only 400 or 300 miles away? 
and beyond. It's now better known as Tala 